Oh, I'm sorry. My crystal keeps hitting the table. I was like, oh, I'm going to have a bunch of crystal fodder this episode. Show them show your crystal. Oh, yeah. If you're watching at home, look at how big that is a, this crystal is. A thick ass fake crystal. It's a crystal. real crystal. It's gorgeous. I love yeah. this necklace. Thank you to Madeline from last podcast now for yes, loaning us. For loaning us their crystal. <laughs> just the one. I'm just going to keep it really safe, except I'm just knocking it again. I'm probably going to have to take off the crystal. I mean, I have this Ianthi dangling in my eyes. This is really annoying. I didn't feel like putting the um, moons on my forehead. Moons over my hammy. Moons over my hammy. The best breakfast. You know, I moons don't know. Moons over Ianthi. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if moons over my hammy actually is the best breakfast at Denny's, but it is the one that I would always order just because I like to say the name. Of course. It's the, the quintessential stupid restaurant food title. Moons over my hammy. Um, but we're not here to talk about Denny's. They don't have Denny's in Prithian as far as I know. Oh, but if they did, would they be 24 hours? And that would be really nice for them. <laughs> it would be because they have a lot of stuff going on in the night. So, yeah. It There's would be no nice. takeout they're, here. They're, that really, honestly, of all the things of why I don't know if I would fit in in Prithian, well, many of those things is because there's no takeout. I do think that if you're in the high fey courts, though, they just have servants though, who will get you anything you want. Yeah, but then I'd night. feel guilty all the time. Like, I'd be really bad with but servants. I don't know. This, this, see, getting a snack in the middle of the night, you might just be approached by a shirtless Oh. I fail. <laughs> oh, just wake up and I go, snack, snack, until someone hears me. Yeah. No, but then he, someone will come and bite your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling it, man. I just, I can't wait for it to get more throbby. I know that we're so close. This is edging. This is Sarah J. Mass edging. I've never been edged this far because I don't think I'm patient enough to be edged. Well, now you're going to be. Oh, no. <laughs> and I hope everyone at home is throbbing as well. Throb alongside me, won't you? <laughs> Consensually. Mm, consensually <laughs> throb. Yes. Mm. Only if you want to. Yes, throb if you so choose. Um, but we're not talking about that scene anymore because we are out of a court of thorns and roses. We have now begun the journey into... A court of mist Mist and and fury. fury. Mm, This is a good one, guys. This book. The second book is what got me like, okay, like sped me into the rest of these books that I just like read with such fire that I thought that the pages were going to set a flame. Got you on lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what the youth say? Um, yes. (laughs) <laughs> oh no! <laughs> we don't know what the youth. I feel say. as though I heard somebody say it on at the internet before. Yeah, smack at the lock, right? Smack in the lock. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what the Zoomers say. Um, so we <laughs> we're all reading the same smut under the same night sky, though, isn't that? Isn't that nice? I'm somewhere out thereing us right now, but somewhere we're not in Five Goes West. Out there. Oh my God, she's turned into a mouse. I'm glad there's no sexy mice in this. I'm not into that. Oh, you're <clears> not? <throat> like, I'm so into that. I was like, where? no, I'm a monster fucker, so I'm not into a sexy mouse unless the mouse was some sort of mutant mouse. But, like, I'm saying, all right, throw it out there. Gus, I'm bringing up Gus again. Oh, not Gus again. He turns into, like, a big, thick boy. You wouldn't kiss? <laughs> I saw, he's dumb, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's nice for a while. I feel like he might be, like, learning to say what's... We've all banged a Gus before in our time, you know, where you're just like, just shut your mouth. <laughs> just be big and thick. I mean, I'd look at somebody doing an animation version of him as a human. I'd look at it. Yeah, just um, to see. Sorry, I'm pulling up one thing real quick. Just don't mind me. I'm looking at the end of this. Do, 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 do. Okay, so we're going to creak open this book again. Because it's rusty for some reason. and Yeah, it's because of all the wet it's it, got it got before. Yeah, yeah. And dried. Now it's all yeah, yeah curly and wavy, too. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm. Um, so immediately upon opening this book, we find that the map in the front 
is more detailed. We have some more spots checked off that we didn't have. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. So I think that we're getting a foreshadowing of perhaps uh, maybe some more traveling going on in this book. Hmm. Like Um, basketball? Like basketball? Yeah. Look at me, sports girl. I don't even know what you're talking about. They go traveling when when you're running with the ball. You see, oh my God, did I know more sport than you? Do yeah, sport? definitely. Wow, doesn't take much. Sorry, I didn't but I'm mean proud to of derail you. Derail you? No, no, please derail all you like. <laughs> we're seeing all of this again through Feyre's eyes, so we're only getting locations based on what she is going to see in each of the respective books. We discussed Jackie that I like to study the beginning of the like at the beginning. I like to look at the maps, like, and you don't. You like to no. gather the information then go back. So I'm not going to dwell too long on these new names and places. But I will say there are spots on both Prithian and the large continent to the east that have locations now charted, and that wasn't in the first book. Ooh, going traveling, but not with balls or with balls. I think maybe walls. (laughs) Different kinds of balls. Testicles. (laughs) Thank you, Natalie. You're welcome. (laughs) So... (laughs) We come to a prologue where we find Feyre is having a nightmare. We're inside of her brain. She's back under the mountain reliving the killings that she just went and did in order to save Tamlin and his people. So she's living through this over and over again, and we're kind of learning from this that she's, like, not thriving, right? No, she's not sliving at all. So now moving forward... The rest of most of her books were going to come in parts. So they're actually segmented part one, part two, part three. And the fifth one, I believe, has four parts. So the first part of this book is called The House of Beasts. Again, Feyre is not thriving here. Our first reintroduction to her is coming up to her uh, vomiting after waking up from this nightmare she was having in the prologue. She is just replaying the events over and over again of the last couple months in her head as she attempts to adjust to this new life and body. Because as you recall, she has an entirely new brain, body, head, ears. They're all different now. She's fey now. Also, I feel like the main thing that would get so difficult from going from human to fey is you, since you hear so much better, how do you sleep? How do you act? Like, besides the fact that if I didn't just kill a bunch of young, innocent fey, right. um, I probably also wouldn't be sleeping just because I'd be like, turn it down. Down, you crickets. I don't know whatever sounds happen in the spring court. Sure, sure, sure. I agree. You know, seeing things too vibrantly, the noises would be too much. Yeah, for sure. I feel like that would, I, as much as I'd love to be Faye, um, I think it would be a scary transition. Except no, no delivery. There's not a grub Faye out there. There's not a grub Faye? Yeah, like Grubhub. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Or I guess, I mean, I don't think there are grub phase either because they're all really hot. Yeah, I like you meant like, oh, like an insect, like the wormy thing. Oh, yeah. No, grub they got fae. worms. No, they got big worms. They got big old worms. They do. Fay bays, get fae down. Bays, they get down. Sorry, I was thinking about the dune worms. No, we're not doing dune worms. Sorry. Coming into this fey power seems like uh, it would be awesome. Yeah, the learning curve would be really steep. Yes. She reflects on how much property damage she's caused because of this new power. She keeps, like, slamming into doors too hard, like, shattering glasses, she's things like that. too strong. She's too strong. She stares at her new hands and sighs at the tattoos still covering her left arm, her bond and bargain still intact with reason. Even though he has yet to make good on his one week a month promise. Three months have gone by and there's been no Feyre napping so far. The, Where is he? Maybe he's not going to make her do it, you know? So though her new body is strong, her resolve has crumbled. She has a dark hole in her chest and nightmares in the darkness. I've been there before, girl. Yes. I know, right? I we mean, can relate. And I do think that it is fun that I, I – not fun to play around with her mental health. But I do think that it's not something that is – it's such a human part of her that it doesn't – that they're not dealing with as much. Or so she thinks, I feel like, yeah. in the world of the Fae. Yeah. Of just, like, being truly depressed – and essentially having everyone around her just being like, nah, she's fine. And everybody well, else. I think everything's fine. And everybody else is sort of fine, as we'll find out. Um, 
When she gets sick in the night, Tamlin never wakes up or at least pretends not to. And, you know, maybe that's because he's trying to give her space. But she knows that he gets the same kind of terrors at night um, and that he goes through these same things in the in the in the darkness in his sleep. And sometimes he's taken to sleeping at the foot of the bed in beast form like he's having like a little PTSD situation. He's not thriving either, but. Maybe a little more than her. For now, neither seem able to confront it to one another. They're both like avoiding it. I feel like that he just doesn't know what to do. And I actually think it's really cute that he sleeps as a beast at the edge of her bed. I mean, I would wake up and be like, I want that beast to fuck me. But it's also really sweet that, like, as a protector man, that he feels like that's the only thing he can do because he doesn't have, he doesn't know how to communicate with her properly. I get it. I I, I agree. I don't think it's, like, a horrible thing to do. I I do think it's a little, you can tell that he's going through something, too, that he uh, didn't like ever comfort her when she's throwing up. Um, that's a yes. that's a whole different thing. Favor describes feeling uncertain whether or not she's really out from under the mountain, and I can relate to that in a more boring human way. Oh yeah, how boring. Like just in a like not fantasy fay excitement under Just because we're human doesn't mean we're boring. I think it does. No. Uh, we also experience life. We experience loss. Eh. No, it fucking sucks. I want to be Faye. I do. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Am I becoming one of those target signs like done adulting, ready to Faye? I think, oh, I think that ship has no. sailed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we need to start putting the signs up in the house. No, I can't. Nope. I can't live, laugh, love. I <laughs> won't do it. Uh, it'll be a different one. Don't worry. It'll okay. be completely different. We're chuggy. Um, So... This makes me wonder if this is something Mass has herself experienced because that is sort of a a, a, an anxiety uh, kind of response when you get out of a really dark situation and sometimes your brain tells you you're still there in it. That's happened to me for fucking sure. Like, oh yeah, those moments of panic. Yeah, yeah, it's absolute panic and. Like, I wonder if that's something she went through because she she sort of describes it in a way that makes me feel like she might have. And also, Mass has been very open about her mental health struggles and stuff. And Sarah, if, he, again, you want to be friends with us, um, we will be friends with you and we can talk about this anytime. Love talking about mental health struggles. I'm always here for you. Um, <laughs> I'm just holding on to my crystal. Like, I'm gripping the crystal, hoping she'll be friends with me. Maybe this, <gasps> I'm using my power. It's a wish crystal. It's a wish crystal. I'm going to keep wishing. I got some thrones. Robins to wish for. So you <laughs> what? Sorry, this book is where it gets throbbed, man. It's true. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It is true. Um, so yeah, that is a quite a scary feeling in my experience yes. to have that. Like, am I? Is this all a dream? Am I still like trapped in this horrible spot that I was in? So chapter two begins. We see Tamlin and Feyre arguing over whether or not she's going to come with Tamlin and Lucian to the local village. Tamlin offers her a firm, no, she will not. But Feyre does not want to stay behind. She wants to be a part of this world that she's now going to be ruling over. She wants to help repair everything in the aftermath. See, this is the thing. I feel like this is the part where Tamlin thinks he's daddy. Like, he's like, he's being daddy. But what he's really being is father. And father isn't sexy. Mm -mm. Daddy is sexy. but (laughs) To some, to some. But father is never sexy. No, definitely not. Um, and, and yes, I agree. And I think that's the counter side, the flip side to that protective streak is then infantilizing. Yes. So it can go really too far very quickly. And he's kind of getting in that place where it's out of love, but he's trying to protect her too to, the po- much. to the point where he's not even hearing her anymore. So get out of here, father. Yeah, she doesn't need a father. Clearly, she had a father who wasn't caring for her already. So oh, she yeah, was yeah, fine. Yeah. She doesn't have the same those kind of daddy issues. You know what I'm saying? But so, I think human Feyre did have those daddy issues. Sure. But also. But Feyre. 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 Oh, my God. How have we not done that yet? Mm-hmm. Well, she's new to being Fey. Yeah. But Natalie and I talk about this a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do. But I feel um, like she doesn't need that. No, definitely not. And, she, and, and Feyre touches on that in these opening chapters that she's not the same girl that came that walked into that under the mountain 
to save Tamlin, even though she was already a badass at that time. It's not like she oh, was yeah. some like, little meek baby. So Tamlin is, does not feel like it's safe for her. He's He says she's given enough and that she needs to just, in, you know, live, laugh, love in her house. Oh, no. Which to me, I'd just be like, no, thank you. Yeah. Can I go to village, please? Um, and quit. I, I, why do I even have to ask you, Tamlin? Why do I have to get your permission? I do love how much Feyre hates saying please. That's one thing that I did notice in this reread of every time she's just like, and then I said the dreaded word, please. I'm like, it's okay to say please. It's not a bad word. It's not. I understand I, in the that context, intonation. It's yes. like, do I need to ask my husband permission for things? Yuck. Not husband yet. They actually not married. They got engaged. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> Can you believe it? <gasps> Um, a month after returning from under the mountain, Tamlin proposed, and it had been a joyous moment for Feyre. It was the thing she had been fighting for, and she's been tasked with preparing all the festivities for the wedding, a job that she's actually not particularly interested in. As someone that also just planned a wedding, that it has not ever been, like, I don't like to plan things, I felt her so hard while reading this part. And because she's like, I don't want to just wear a fun, fancy dress and just plan the parties. I don't want to just plan the parties. And how, like, I remember reading it while I was planning my wedding. I was like, get your favorite. Fucking understand. As somebody who likes to plan parties, planning a wedding is not the same kind of fun because there are vipers on every side of you being like, <laughs> you need to spend more money. You need a charger. What's a charger? A plate that a doesn't plate get under used. A plate. But we're supposed to. Ha- okay, I guess I need to spend another seven thousand uh, dollars. Uh, um, God, I'm so happy it's done. Yeah, Be- best day of my life. But also so happy it's done. Anyway, anyway, sorry. yes, I don't want to have. I'm with you, Feyre. So yeah, we we feel you. Imagine going through all of that, fighting a giant ass worm, torture, dying, being turned. Going through all of these things and then someone's just like, okay, you did it. Now it's pl- party planning. It seems That's like another you punishment. Do I know. Get the fuck out of here. She just murdered a giant worm for you. And now you're like, you like dresses, don't you? Here's a pretty dress for you to wear. No, she's a trouser. She loves trousers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole society that needs rebuilt and you're just sequestering her into picking out lace napkins. That's bullshit. Spring Court also just celebrated winter solstice, which signifies something else. Feyre's birthday, the same day as the solstice. She's like girl Jesus. And she also suffers from many other people who have birthdays around a big holiday, and then everyone forgets her. So she's so used to her birthday, and I was just like, oh my god, that is such a, like— holiday, birthday, as someone that deals with Holden every year because he's always gets sad. I'm sorry, deals with is not the right phrase, uh, but he always gets sad because his birthday is right after Christmas and no one's ever around and everyone always forgets. Yeah, it's hard for Henry that his birthday's on Valpurgis Nacht because it's always, you know, left to the side. Oh, yeah, um, I'm always maypole around. I'm like, Henry who? <laughs> It's your brother. Oh, Heather my God. It's your it's husband? Yeah. <laughs> Did you know that's what, what Natalie actually means? It means born on Christmas. Whoa. I'm basically Feyre. Oh, my God. My birthday's in April. Except you so. don't want to be Feyre right now. No. No. D- definitely not. Um, Only it, you would kind of love the wearing the frilly, frilly dresses oh, yeah. and then and planning this kind of party. I will say if the fashion... Her dresses in the spring court are not my vibe. Nah, brah. Spring Mm -hmm. court just ain't my vibe at all. In fact, I even purchased a dress that was a la the spring court that was very, like, pink and rosy. And I put it on last night and I burst into tears because they looked horrible in it. I'm not meant for – I'm not meant for that kind of fashion. I don't think you look horrible. I imagine you didn't look horrible, but I also get what you're saying. Those sort of colors make me look kind of sickly, I think, a lot of the time. I'm just so pale. Which is beautiful. Your skin's beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm a bit of a Snow White in a beast world. You are a Snow White with your dark hair. Give me all um, your birds. Oh, God. <laughs> is that what she does? <laughs> I don't remember if she oh, talks okay. to birds or not. Oh, I think she does. Um, anyway, uh, she doesn't tell anybody. Uh, just like Holden. <laughs> 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 Ferris just like Holden. Um, she... <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's continue that comparison, please. Just imagine Holden in the big frilly dress being like, I don't like, want to make a party. <laughs> oh, I wish I could go to the village. <laughs> um, So uh, she's marrying this. But it's kind of weird. She's marrying this veritable stranger, and they don't even know each other's birthdays because Sam Tamlin doesn't know that she just skipped her birthday, and I guess they've never asked each other. He's really bad at communicating. This is the part of of the series that you really can see. Tamlin is just man. I feel like as we go through to, I think he's just he doesn't know. He's never had to communicate his feelings before, and he deals with everything through his anger. And I feel like that is it, it, it's not that it's not his fault, but I feel like he needs help. He needs someone that will draw it out of him. Can you and fix I, him? Oh my god, I love to fix. <laughs> Should I fix him? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna marry Tamlin. Okay. Sorry, Vera. <laughs> I'm sure it's gonna work out for them. Yeah. But yeah, if they yeah. if they don't, you I'll you go. In. Yeah, you go. Um so now the wedding is two weeks away, and she's struggling to get Tamlin to give her some freedom. More so trusting that Feyre can make her own decisions about it. He She won't let her say, this is what I want. He keeps saying, no, you can't. I'm, I, I'm, And she's trying to understand because he couldn't protect her, I guess, for whatever reasons. He yeah, and now he feels bad. And he's, he doesn't want to go through that again. So she's trying to understand on that level, like it comes from a, a place of caring. Um she doesn't push hard because of that. Um, but he, again, is being quite infantilizing to her in these scenes, basically, basically telling her to run off and paint. But she does love to paint. That's but her she's fault. too sad to paint. She's too sad. She can't get there yet. Although I imagine with Faye senses, the paintings could probably get better, right? <laughs> we could hope so. <laughs> just I love the idea of just like it's a beast. It's like, oh, is that did is that what you drew? Oh, here? it's you're so pretty, Feyre. <laughs> That's what little girls... You're infantilizing her. <laughs> yeah, because he does. He's like, go look at dresses. Yeah. That's what little girls like. <laughs> no mention that I just watched you murder a giant worm using only your wits, I guess. So she fairly points out that she has the strength of a fae now, so she'll be much safer than before, which is accurate. But Tamlin's concerned that now she'll have a target on her back because all of Amarantha's allies will want her dead. And also, when the... High Fae gave her those drops to bring back to life that they might be a little bit regretful of doing that because they she might have sucked some of their magic up. Well, because also, like, part of that is giving her a portion of their power. Yeah. Well. To give her life. Uh, and, you know, theoretically, but we don't know because Tamlin won't let her train at all. Mm. So she, from Feyre's viewpoint inside of her head, she's sort of trying to ignore if that's happening or not, mm -hmm. except that she's so strong, she keeps breaking all their shit. Lucian is more on the side of Feyre. He's trying to, like, kind of help her, but he refuses to interject himself into the conversation, which is very disappointing to Feyre because she is kind of seeing him as her friend now. And he also thinks she should be training, but he doesn't want to go against Tamlin as the High Lord. So she backs down and she watches them leave and it's very... It's she's very unhappy about mm -hmm. it. It's here we meet Ayanthi. Yeah, that's you. She is a high For priestess. For those of you that are listening, um, Natalie <laughs> did dress as Ianthi today. I'm not her in character because we learn a lot about her later on. Which, mm. Anyway, um, she is a high priestess, a ranking that we'd probably equate to, I guess, a sexy witch priest. Like, that's the thing, because in theory, sexy witch priest sounds bad fucking ass. It does. We're going to learn a lot more about priestesses going forward. She is an old friend of Tamlin's who's come to help Feyre transition into this new world and be of service to the new couple. Feyre doesn't really mind. She's been obligated to these endless affairs of Fey coming to thank her, celebrate, make treaties, basically pick up where they left off 50 years prior before Amarantha. And Feyre's not really up to it just yet. She's kind of processing a few things. Ianthi attends these things with her and often takes the lead, giving Feyre some time to process and prepare. She's sort of like her lady-in-waiting or something. 
And yet also it's like her lady in waiting, but also like a mixture of like giving her advice and stuff like that. So she's like a little bit of like an older sister mommy type, like a, a Meg from Little uh, Women. Yeah. And like a little bit of that and a dash of lady in waiting because like she's still below Feyre. Yeah, exactly. Um, so she's taking over a lot of the planning duties as well for the wedding. Thank God. Yeah. As well as dressing and preparing Feyre for all these events, such as like, she kind of also is sort of like a Miss Manners coach, whatever they're yeah. called. Yeah. Um, and also a party planner. <laughs> so Feyre's wearing these sort of grand gowns that don't really suit her or feel right, but she's also sort of just allowing it to happen because she doesn't want to choose the things. It seems like Right now, Feyre isn't really concerned with any of these image things. She'd just rather have Ionthi pick all of it for her. She's glad. Ionthi. Did I say something? Ionthi. Ionthi. Yes. Ionthi. This um, name is, I say it wrong all the time, so we're going to try to keep not saying it wrong. (laughs) And so she's glad to give Ionthi. The reins. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. You're killing it. <laughs> okay. All the high priestesses wore the billowing, artfully twisted and layered robes, though they certainly were far from matronly. Ianthe's slim waist was on display with a fine belt of sky blue, limpid stones, each perfectly oval and held in shining silver. And atop her hood sat a matching circlet, a delicate band of silver with a large stone at its center. A panel of cloth had been folded up beneath the circlet, a built-in swath meant to be pulled over the brow and eyes when she needed to pray, beseech the cauldron and mother, or just think. I do like, it's like a parrot. Just like yeah, put yeah it just put eyes. it over her eyes. She, uh, she, she also, there, also falls right to sleep too. <laughs> so, Feyre <laughs> describes Ayanthi. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm so worried. I'm going to say this wrong. No, if it just in my brain, it's like the I, and then it's like an ant, so it's more Ianthi. You know, what I think the problem is is my little brother's name is Ian, and so all I see is Ian at the beginning. Ah, uh, gotcha. Ianthi. Ianthi. Feyre describes Ianthi as sensual and sexy. We'll learn more about the high priestesses, like I said, but as we go on later on, it, we're going to learn a lot more about it later on in the books. So it's clear in Prithian these spiritual women are not like nuns. They are instead sexual beings. Yes! Which is pretty cool. They talk about how, like part of their worship is like sex because it's, you know, they they have a womb and there's like celebrating it's mother like creating nature. power and all. I mean, I metal. dig it. Oh, yeah. In, in fact, they uh, they are encouraged to dally and bear offspring in that sense. So, I aunt thee. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so, I aunt thee has been sort of a companion and teacher to Feyre. As they are going over wedding plans, she asks Feyre what sort of roses she would like at the ceremony. White, pink, yellow, red, not red. I hated that color. More than anything. Amarantha's hair, all that blood, the welts on Claire Better's broken body spiked to the walls of under the mountain. So, you know, this is not necessarily somebody who's in a right headspace. At nah, the man. She's really um she's really struggling and literally screaming through the night every night and nobody's asking her about it. No. And if you're about to have a wedding and you're seeing blood. Everywhere, maybe you need to take a breather. It's okay. We all have anxiety. It's called intrusive thoughts, oh, friends. Oh, yeah, man. So It's all good, but we got to talk about it, and we got to be able to lean on each other and create true. a sense of community. But if your husband keeps turning into a beast and sitting at the foot of your bed, mm, who are you too supposed turned to turned on, to? then it's a problem. You then know? you won't just have sex, right? <laughs> Ianthi doesn't have the same scars from under the mountain, we learn, because her family fled and escaped as Amarantha was taking over. So she's content in helping to plan the wedding and strategize about the choices that Feyre's making. Feyre will be the wife of a high lord, of course, so all of her decisions will be scrutinized, just like Michelle Obama. Oh, my God. Always talking about her arms and not talking about all of the amazing things that she does. Right. But also her arms. Her arms are nice. <laughs> you know? 
can't take that away from her either. So this is sort of a there. There's a little bit I think of resentment there because Ian. <laughs> Oh my God, you guys, why can't I say her name? <laughs> Can I just do it? Can we just put it in? Like, I'll mouth it and I just say it right the one time and it goes in. I just I don't want the... you to, like, beat yourself up over not, like, saying it wrong after Oh, the I fact. agree. I am the – there's a little bit of resentment there because – there, she didn't have to go through all of these things. So I can see a little bit of resentment happening. Yeah. Um, even down to the wedding dress, she's she's helping Feyre choose, uh, which Feyre doesn't like. She doesn't like her wedding dress. In her mind, she's calling it a monstrosity of tall. Tool. That's tool. tool. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so many confusing words. Um, in her mind, she's calling it a monstrosity of tool. So that sucks. Yeah, man. And especially like like she's got all these dresses already that she doesn't even like and but also through her depression she can't even like talk about how she's really feeling anyway. So she's just letting all of these things wash over her. And I think a lot of us have struggled with things like that in our life where you just like you hate it but you don't even have the energy to say anything about it. Yeah, and that's sort of where she is in her headspace. She's too weak to argue much about it. She's just like, yeah, sure, that's fine. So Ionthi reveals that she has the hots for Lucian during these conversations. And though Favor doesn't Which I get of course. And Feyre doesn't want to tell her and hurt her feelings, but she gets the sense that Lucian, again, is resentful that that she just got away from everything during Amarantha's reign. And, you know, they all had to suffer there. Oh, she was just, I guess, vacationing on the continent or something. I'd probably be fairly resentful, too. Yeah. Ianthi looks at Feyre's Bond tattoo with Rizan in distaste and suggests that they get gloves for the ceremony. Which, fair, I don't know that, like, Tamlin, like, wants to be staring at that tattoo at the wedding, but whatever. That part I, I kind of get. Yeah. That night, as Tamlin enters the bedroom, we learn through Farah's musings in her head that she and Tamlin are still keeping separate quarters. Mm -hmm. Though he sleeps in her bed most every night. Although I have met many a couple that do sleep separately and like swear by it in their marriages and in their relationships. And if that works for you, go for you. But I do think in this situation that he's avoiding the fact that like his fiance is screaming all night long and like he's probably like I gotta get my sleep too and also trying to give her some space so like I can see that so I don't know if they're sleeping separately for the right reason yeah I don't think it's because like he snores you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> although wouldn't a beast snore probably. I tell ya yeah I'd get used to it <laughs> I'd get used to it I need a beast <laughs> oh baby I can get used to this um yeah, I think it's more so an avoidance yeah. thing, what I would uh, gauge from this. So it's a choice. Regardless, as he comes in that evening and strips his shirt off, she pulls back the sheets to reveal that she's already nude. And then we get a, get treated to a lovely sex scene. Oh, yes. This is the first elongated sex scene between them, as the other two have been in sort of dire straits. So this is an almost four-page long sex scene. Thank which, you. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, Sarah. Well, especially, like, I mean, I think it's the one way that they do, like, they have that lust between them. And it's the one thing that has always worked. And I also, like, have you never been in a relationship like that before? <laughs> Where, like, you no. don't get along in any other way, shape, or form. Oh, no, Natalie, never? She's never had it. Never had a lust relationship before. <laughs> I was well, a virgin when I met Henry. I forgot about that, that he did force you to wipe yourself clean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ew! <laughs> He, I don't think he did. <laughs> oh. I just, like, I get it. I've been there. I've been with someone that, I mean, I hate to say keep your mouth shut, but, like, I've done the, like, yeah, we don't need to date. Why don't I just come over to your place? Uh, yes. For sure. <laughs> we don't need to go out to dinner. But then, you know, you don't get married to that, so. Yeah, you try not to. Yeah. You try not to. So they're not necessarily connecting in a, like an emotional way, but it could just be because they're not there yet. But they do connect physically. <laughs> yeah. Um, so very much f fun four page sex scene. And as their lovemaking concludes, Tamlin apologizes for his refusal earlier. He divulges that he feels protective of her because he couldn't 
save her before, and he can't bear the thought of losing her again. I get that. She understands, but I have to say this sounds an awful lot like his needs are being Mm, met and not hers. Yep. I'm just saying. You uh, you are saying truths right now. Mm -hmm. Wait. No, they're not done. They have sex again. They have sex again. Like that kind of man. Like four pages of intense and then immediately jumping right back in. Hell yeah, man. And as they're concluding again and they're speaking sweet nothings to each other, Feyre says that she will feel strange to have people call her high lady. Tamlin explains that there is no such thing as a high lady. What do you mean there's no such thing as a high lady? The heat, his touch, all of it stopped. He looked up from between my legs, and I almost climaxed at the sight of it. But what he said, what he'd implied, he kissed the inside of my thigh. High lords only take wives, consorts. There has never been a high lady. Excuse me, sir? Excuse me? I mean, love that he's telling her this while he is literally eating her out, which can, you know, put It'll some salve on anything. Yeah. <laughs> soothe the news. Uh, but um, that's a little fucked up, Tamlin. Also, probably a conversation they should have had before they were about to get married. Yeah. But who am I to say? I'm just some dumb human. <sighs> we'll the, never be fair. <laughs> oh, the next day, Farah is left with Lucian. And it seems that Tamlin has relented enough to let her go see the village with about a hundred guards around her. Thanks, father. Yeah. Lucian and Farah pick up their sibling energy that they where they left off from the first book. She challenges him as to why he doesn't speak up when Tamlin is being overbearing to her. We need order, Farah. We need rules and ranking and order if we're going to stand a chance of rebuilding. So what he says goes. I am the first one the others look to. I set the example. Don't ask me to risk my stability of this court by pushing back. Not right now. He's giving you as much free reign as he can. So he's trying to be the go-between here. Yeah. She asks if this is to be her eternity now. Her much, much longer future. Wearing dresses and planning parties. And I mean, for a thousand year lifespan, that's uh, that's a lot. That would of make parties. me a little bummed out. Yeah. <laughs> Although some people would love that, but that's just uh, not Feyre. A thousand years of it? Mm. I mean, it does. You never have to worry about money. You don't have to worry about you're right. how, where I your next meal is going to come from. <laughs> like, you're right. you know, you have all of the things, and it's like, okay, I'm dressed. I don't even have to put the dresses on myself. <laughs> so, some people. <laughs> I try to. I just go to Jeff. I wake him up in the morning and I put my arms up and I go, Jess me! And then he goes, look at my little doll wife. And then he puts the clothes on his little doll oh, wife. Oh, he does it. I assume no, that when you did it, he'd go, stop doing no, that, Jackie, please. I've got to go to work. <laughs> I can't put clothes on you right now. <laughs> um. Yeah, so... To Fair's dismay here, Lucian reiterates what Ianthi already... Ianthi. Wow. So to her dismay, Lucian reiterates that Ianthi has what she has already explained, that as the wife of a high lord, she's expected to fill certain roles, that in the wake of all this terror, it's important to give a certain image to the people of Prithian to feel the stability again, which sounds like a bunch of bullshit. If I've ever heard it, that they're just trying to make her stop complaining. I think that Lucian also knows it's a bunch of bullshit. He's just trying yeah. to, like, essentially, again, be the go-between of, like, keeping everybody chill because that's kind of, like, his job. Yeah. He's like sure. the consigliere. Yeah, he sort of is the consigliere. Um, and I, this is sort of a first lady position that she's going into. And I... I I know I could never do this. So maybe, like you said, some people would really enjoy this role. I wouldn't like to be the person who just like, hello, yes, hello. Oh, no. very nice to meet you. As like the people come into the the, the court. I got too much spew mouth. Yeah, That's my main problem. I'm just be like, and then like I'm all of a sudden telling secrets that I shouldn't be just because I'm like, oh, you want to hear the tea? And then yeah. I, I'd get in trouble all I the time. I can't look reserved. Like Meghan Markle, like... 
uh, I understand why Meghan Markle had to get out of that because like you're not allowed to like wear certain things and have your knees showing. Yeah, and I also can't sit. like side smirk. I feel like Meghan Markle does a lot of like side. Mm. Mm. And I can't mm, like. Do I look good? Mm. I don't know if that's a requirement to be. Oh, <laughs> I thought that was like a thing. Maybe it is. In this conversation, that this I guess argument really that they're having together, Lucian reveals to her that the Spring Court participates in a tithing twice a year, which is some church BS. I, mm. I think um, they have a tradition of receiving gifts from the people, even though they don't need any of it. Within the estate. It's just always been done. Yeah, which I'm never a big fan of that. Yeah. That explanation for anything. Um, but and she, neither is Vera, I'll tell no, you what. No, and she's expected to be there and to put on this facade because the people need her to be there. Yeah. She pushes back, but then Lucian is trying to tell her this in earnesty, I think, but he's also kind of guilting her. Lucian's love was murdered We've learned that the person that he fell in love with oh. earlier on, I think this was in um, like the middle of the Court of Thorns and Roses section. Um, he had a love and he, his father killed her because she was a lesser fae. So he's basically kind of guilting her being like Tamlin got his love to come back. So give him a break, I guess, which I don't know if that's really fair of him to do that. No, but he's just he just needs her to do what. Tamlin needs her to do. Yeah. So this is his job. And so he, I think he's just doing his job. But also, Lucian, let me fix you. Are you broken? I can put you back together. Are you going to do uh, sister husbands? Oh, yeah, I could. Husband I could. wife? Could, yeah. Um, brother husbands? Brother husbands. Yes. I mean, it would be really difficult because a lot of, you know, sister wives is about spreading seed and making as many of your, like, family of uh, heaven soldiers and whatever. Mm. Um, so it would be difficult with only one baby maker. That's why I'm into commune living. And then we'll all switch it up. Oh, okay. All right. Fine. Um, that's nice of you to try to fix them all. Yeah, I really I'll think fix. that's giving. And so basically, even though I do think it's an unfair thing to say, how is she really supposed to argue back when he brings up his dead lover? Yeah. So they end up, he, she and Lucian are with all the guards and they end up arriving to the, the little village there. And the people within the village are thankful and like reverent around her, but they refuse to accept her help. She's done too much already. Basically, they're all parroting what Tamlin's already said. Because she did save all of them. She did, but she wants to. She wants to have her hands. She likes dirty hands. Oh, I know. But they say then no, I'm no, so no. So not Feyre. <laughs> I really am not. I don't. Th I don't identify with Feyre, but I um, enjoy her character outside of the painting and who she dallies with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, outside of the painting. But, uh, yeah, basically they're all t it's just parroting what Tamlin's already said. So they quickly kind of turn back because the villagers are like, we are good. Thank you. So she goes back and she begins to further retreat into herself. Because like, everybody, like everyone is working because they have to rebuild everything that Amarantha destroyed. She just like went through and destroyed all of the, all of the cities. Um, yeah. And in, in whatever, in the way that Feyre feels, the way that she wants to help is to be of use. She wants to go build, rebuild things with people. She doesn't want a party plan, but apparently she doesn't get a choice in the matter. She, she feels completely isolated. The vastness of my now unending existence yawned open before me. I let it swallow me whole. Not a great way to go into your wedding. Nah. It's like already stressful enough. I know. Like Jeff and I didn't even really argue through our wedding planning process, and I don't understand how we did that. We were like on a team the entire time battling everyone else. It felt like we were back to back, and we both had swords, and we're just like, get away from us. Get away from us, but also help us, but get away from us. Um, so like she's not even feeling that connection with Tamlin. Yeah. It's hard enough just after, I mean, I didn't even like just, kill some innocent people before the wedding. Wank! <laughs> How do you think I stay this youthful? <laughs> it's not easy, okay? <laughs> Nobody ever feels sorry for me after I kill them because, oh, I killed people, but it's hard. I have to be on camera. Yeah. Okay? Um, in the days leading up to the wedding, despite Tamlin's troubled nights, 
there was sparks of him returning to who he was likely before the fall. Um, so Farah is like drowning. And, but she's watching Tamlin sort of thrive in these parties. She feels disjointed. And, at the, you know, all the preamble stuff before the wedding, all these like people are coming into the court to celebrate them and like be a witness to it. And Tamlin is in super high spirits. I mean, he's got the girl and his kingdom's back and all these people. He's like sort of in his zone. But he like barely knows any of these people. I feel like that's also really important to note is that how, like, Tamlin is so down to have, like, the whole place filled with a bunch of people. Everybody's kind of, like, drinking and talking and hanging all day. He wants it, like, filled with people. But he doesn't, like, connect with any of them. No. He's not, like, friends or buddy buddies with any of these They're people. They're not talking about their feelings. No, it's just people and like that would drive me banoonies just having people around all the time getting hammered all day and then I gotta be in a frilly dress planning a party Ugh, no and and really this is kind of cruel in a way because the, you know he's talking with all these people who maybe he doesn't know them very mo- emotionally close but he might have known them for centuries yeah and Farah doesn't know any of these people and so She's sort of shriveling further and further into herself, and he doesn't seem to be noticing. But thankfully, Ianthe is there to facilitate all of these interactions because that's sort of one of her jobs. Thayra ponders on when the last time was that she laughed. That hurts my soul, girl. Yeah. The morning of her wedding arrives. Thayra reiterates how much she hates the dress in her thoughts. It was a monstrosity of tulle and chiffon and gossamer, so unlike the loose gowns I usually wore. The bodice fitted, the neckline curved to plump my breasts, and the skirts. The skirts were a sparkling tent, practically floating in the balmy spring air. It makes me think of those big floof gowns that were really popular in the 80s. Yes. Like all the 80s like bridal photos are just like all shoulders. You can barely see the woman's head. And especially knowing that she has full like sleeves and gloves on to hide the tattoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which she then goes on to describe like the puffy sleeves uh, that were uh, like ridiculous to her. Um she has, you know, she's covered in jewels and pearls and all this stuff. She she's adorned like a Like a doll? Yeah. Um, She's cringing at herself, which sucks Like to go out to her wedding. She hates how she looks. She hates how she looks. It sucks. But, you know, Ianthe did procure these elbow-length gloves that hid her tattoo and and will be herself residing over the wedding. So Ianthe's really made a lot of the choices, like the, the visual choices for it. And now she's also going to be the one, what is it called? Not Reverend. Uh, so, the one presiding over the wedding? The that, one, yeah. yeah. I don't know what that's. The presiding. The presiders. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the host, I want to call it the host of the wedding. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, I'm sure, what it's called. Yeah. So. She has a lot to do with this whole ceremony. There's a big to do, you know, because this is the High Lord's wedding for cauldron's sake. For cauldron's sake. Feyre begins her descent towards the altar. She doesn't want to do this, but as she sees Tamlin at the end, you know, her breath's taken away by his beauty. He's let his glamour down for her. But then she looks down at the ground where she's to walk to him. My vision narrowed on him, on my High Lord. His wide eyes glistening as I stepped onto the soft grass, white rose petals scattered down it, and red ones. Like drops of blood amongst the white, red petals had been sprayed across the path ahead. I forced my gaze up to Tamlin, his shoulders back, head high, so unaware of the true extent of how broken and dark I was inside. How unfit I was to be clothed in white when my hands were so filthy. I see. I get it. It's just like me. Um, So I noted that. I wanted to put that in there because she very clearly expressed... She's going through it. She's in a rough spot. She didn't want red. No. She said specifically, of all of the things, she made no choices about anything, but the one thing she said was not red. And Ianthe... Bitch. Yeah. 
her all because I these, just planned the wedding she fucking wanted. I think maybe interesting um, whether or not she was doing it intentionally. She was not paying attention to anything Farah said. Obviously, this is the one thing she asked to not be in the wedding. Um, so she's starting to like have a panic attack yeah. while she's like walking down the aisle. She attempts to keep walking, but Farah is like effectively falling apart in front of an entire audience as they're staring at her. She starts to get dizzy. She thinks she's going to vomit everywhere in front of these people, these fae, whose kind she just murdered in cold blood that she thinks is in cold blood, even if nobody else does. Her kind. It's her kind now. She's fae, and that's starting to freak her out. This is all too much too fast. She's too broken to put Tamlin through this. I was going to fall apart right there, right then, And they'd see precisely how ruined I was. Help me. Help me. Help me. I begged someone, anyone. Begged Lucian, standing in the front row, his metal eye fixed on me. Begged Ianthe, face serene and patient and lovely within that hood. Save me. Please save me. Get me out. End this. Tamlin, now nervous... Watching her kind of just stand there in the middle. Have a panic attack, but he doesn't fucking know what's going on. No. So he's reaching his hand out. Come on. Come on. Come forward. Again, a little infantilizing. Feyre steps back. And there's a... That's not a good thing. You don't want to see that. Somebody walking down the aisle, them take a step backwards. Yeah, take a pause and then a step back. Oh, it's not not fair and well. Yes. And it is noted by the crowd. People start to murmur, 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 murmur. Then... Thunder cracked behind me, as if two boulders had been hurled against each other. People screamed, falling back, a few vanishing outright as darkness erupted. I whirled, and through the night drifting away like smoke on a wind, I found Reesand straightening the lapels of his black jacket. Hello, Feyre darling. He purred. That's right, Reason has arrived! <laughs> I screamed. <laughs> Reason is here. We don't like him. We no, don't. we don't He's like him. Jerk. We don't like him. We hate him. We hate him. But at this point in time, even reading through it for the first time, it was like, I mean, he did save her. She said, save me, save me, save me in her head. So, Hello, Feyre, darling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... <laughs> he, <laughs> Why are we like 12 year old? I feel like a 12 year old. (laughs) Oh my God. So that's right. Reason has arrived to claim his week after these months have passed. Unsurprisingly, there is an uproar in the crowd as Reason saunters in and mocks the celebration. Regardless of how Feyre feels about this interruption, Reason does what he does, which is shift her mental attention. In her distraction, her worry becomes, where is he going to take me? And she's no longer thinking about this wedding debacle. Tamlin, of course, is furious, but he doesn't make a move on Reason. Ianthe disappears into the hills. She's just gone. Again, something bad happens and she just fucking flees. I guess she's got to take care of Ianthe. Aren't you supposed to be the one that people come to for solace? You're supposed to be the one that is there to protect people as well? What? Are you trying to say that somebody who calls himself a priest might be an asshole? What? There's no way. There's no way. Feyre's obviously not pleased But there seems to be nothing to be done about this. This is a a bond that's magical. So there's vast consequences in breaking this deal. So really, Tamlin doesn't stop it or anything. And she kind of just has to go with him. In this series of slick movements, he slips an arm around Feyre's waist and whispers, Hold on. Then the darkness vanished. I smelled jasmine first, then saw stars. A sea of stars flickering beyond glowing pillars of moonstone that framed the sweeping view of endless snow-capped mountains. Welcome to the night court, was all Reese said. It's the most beautiful place that Feyre has ever seen. After she arrives from whatever strange transportation reason uses to go far, far, very quickly, they land in the night court, which, if you'll recall— If you look at the map, now we look at the map! My map didn't show up yet. I ordered one. 
and we don't have it. Give us our map, Etsy. It's very, I'm very upset. I'm going to write a strong letter to them. Um, no, you're just going to go, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm <laughs> sorry you. for for troubling you <laughs> with mailing it. Um, so, but if you'll recall on the map, it's all the way at the very tippy top of Prithian. Spring Court is the farthest south touching the wall that, se- that segments the Fae from the humans. So this is a very far distance, but he's just sort of zapped them there. We already know that the Night Court is largely covered with sprawling mountain ranges from the map. And this is where we find ourselves now. High in the sky, she sees nothing but gray mountains through the open air space she's landed. Awesome. I know. It's warm, even though there aren't any windows to speak of. And there's snow-capped mountains outside. But it's all open air. But somehow he's controlling the, the temperature in there. She describes a winding series of rooms filled with different forms of sitting and meeting spaces, which is already speaking my language. Everything about this place makes me just like, I want to go. I want to go there. So badly. Also, I could do this as a workspace. I love places to move around. I can't sit at a desk. You offer me like 20 different forms of me sitting weird to write. Huh. Give it to me. Give it to me now. Um. So yeah, there's lush okay. plants, there's sick rugs, and colored glass lanterns. So far, this is nothing like Under the Mountain, though we've heard already that Amarantha allegedly based her dark court from the night court. No, her description depicts beauty, lavish, certainly, but a welcoming space, not deep under a cave in the inside of a mountain and dark and scary. Sexy, though. Yes. Best of all, the Moonstone, moonstone Floors! floors. Man, take me there. That sounds so beautiful. Reason challenges her, suggesting that she asked to be taken away because she's angry with him, but he says, it seems like you wanted to go. I don't know. Seems like you were pleading to be saved. Feyre is incensed. How dare you? I said no such thing. In a rage, he grabs her arms, ripping the gloves off and growls, I heard you say no. Which is great. He did hear her say no, but then the remedy was to abduct her. So I don't know if this is like fully a consensual. It's a little gray area. I mean, she did make the arrangement to go with him for one week a month. Uh, You're right. So I'm not saying that the way in which he took her, but also like, she did say she was going to do this. She did. He did save her life. He did. In this scene, Reason comes off as kind of cruel and hateful. He mocks her dress, calling her a damsel, but sarcastically. This is the Reese we saw under the mountain, combative. And yet, she also detests her dress. She doesn't say that to him. But no. we know that she felt stupid in it. She felt... Uh, She didn't like it. She didn't like how she looked. And he's also picking up on that. She insists she wants to be taken back immediately. But does she really? Mm. She just left a gigantic mess created in part by her. Tamlin was humiliated in front of his people, his entire court. And she obviously didn't want to go through with the ceremony. Regardless, it's reasons weak with Feyre custody. So he makes it clear he will not be taking her back whether she wants to or not. You're right. This is like um, it's like Mrs. Doubtfire, you know, a little bit. A little custody Just battle. like the custody. Daniel! You know. I hope I hope one of them dresses as an old woman. Oh, you can go, Dula! Oh, my God. What if Tamlin gets hired as a maid <laughs> at the night court? <laughs> no! My name is Lady Feather Higgins! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, we, but we don't know. Maybe, maybe we are. Maybe, maybe that, happens. that happens in the future. <laughs> in a rage, Feyre takes her shoe off and hurls it at Reason's back. This really is reminiscent to me of the Nutcracker, and I don't know that Miss Maz did that intentionally, but for any of you Trinas out there, there's a scene at the end of the first act of the Nutcracker where the protagonist little girl throws her shoe at the evil Rat King. In that case, though, This gives the heroic Nutcracker time to plunge the sword into the Rat King as he's distracted. And so that's sort of this Nutcracker scene, but it's interesting Is this your trauma? Is this how you're undoing your ballerina trauma? Oh, no. I have to talk about this? I've been been indoctrinated into the Nutcracker so hard that I can only feel love for it. Okay, all right. Yeah. No, I love the Nutcracker. So 
but I, the reason I bring it up is because I know that she incorporates ballet into Crescent City. So I, I wonder if she does have that in her in her past. But um, in in this gesture, this is her saving herself, which is quite a juxtaposition from the Nutcracker, which is like allowing the prince to have time to save her. And in this, she's just like, fuck you. And she throws it at his back. So she does this. And we get a couple, you know, good pieces of information in the sequence because when she throws the shoe at him, he takes it in his hand and he can turn it into vapor. He touches it and it's just poof, gone. He makes the night with his hands. He does. And two, that he didn't immediately do that to Feyre's head. So we know, at least in this moment, if he's offended by somebody, he's not just going to strike her. Because we don't really know much about him at this point. No, we just know that he's very, like you said, combative and very mysterious. And also she does say, I love how like the descriptions of reason of how he's just the most beautiful man she's ever seen. Yes. And so we get that also this information that Feyre is not just going to like you know, cower to him and and be timid. She's angry. She becomes somebody who was falling apart to being furious with him. And but she doesn't, doesn't show that kind of emotion to Tamlin, does she? No, she she withholds herself because she doesn't want to cause a, a problem. Basically, mm. here she doesn't do that with him, and he doesn't do anything in retribution to her. Like after she throws this shoe, which wouldn't have hurt him anyway, but. You know, he didn't do anything but, like, shake her shoulders like that scene in Airplane. (laughs) So he didn't do any of it. He basically just sort of walks away from the situation. Um, But we also see here Fear is not fearful. Fear is not fearful. We also (laughs) see here that Feyre is not fearful. She's furious. She hasn't buckled under his power, which love to see it. Love to see it. He exits the room and we're introduced to a new voice, someone who we don't actually meet in this scene. All we know, it's a feminine voice, which declares, so that went well, in a very casual conversational tone. And I remember the first time I read that, I was sort of like a little taken aback because it was so casual compared to every other interaction that Favors had so far. Especially with a high lord. Yeah. It's yeah, not definitely not something we would have found under the mountain, even though that's where she thought she was basically being sent back to. Yeah. So yeah, right now, Night Court's not being a lot like under the mountain. Even in her rage and despair, Feyre has to her, admit her room, her quarters she's to remain in during Reason's custody is quote a dream. From the billowing amethyst curtains to the open air views to the cushy bed. I mean, kidnap me, Reason. Please. I can get Stockholm Syndrome for that tub alone. Oh, my God. Let me just read all day and just, like, get to chill. She describes the large tub as more of a pool that hangs off the side of the mountain with oh. the far end flowing off the edge in a waterfall. Oh. You know what? Forget the show. I need somebody to just make a resort themed after Prithian. Please. Wait, I need to do it? Okay, yeah. fine. I'll make it. All right. We'll 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 become best friends with Sarah, and then all of us will make it together. Sister, Come on. Be sisters with us. <laughs> She's being treated in this moment as what seems to be a guest, not a prisoner. Still, the realization of everything that went on today hits her, and she is racked with worry and dread over the fact that most likely people noticed her hesitation before Reason showed up and that there will be something to deal with upon her return. She practically rips the dumb dress off herself, wanting to rid herself of the day. Here she finds night clothes that are what she imagines are night court fashions. And they are pants. She loves a trouser. Sort of more a sensual version of legged clothing, not like the ones she wore out of necessity at the beginning of the series. She puts them on and is overtaken by sadness and sobs herself to a fitful sleep in that gorgeous bed. The next morning, we're greeted with some familiar faces. But also not woken up in the middle of the night by nightmares at this point. She actually sleeps. That's She doesn't mention she had nightmares, that's for certain. So the next morning, we're greeted by some familiar faces, which are the two shadow handmaidens from under the mountain who painted her every night. Mm. Only now they're fully formed fey creatures, whereas they were wispy, shadowy people before. And we finally learn their names here. Nuala and Saradwin, which are very pretty names. Yeah. 
They tell her to get ready to meet Reason for breakfast. And seeing as she doesn't really have anything else to do, she can't do anything else. She decides she's just going to bathe and get dressed. And again, she's putting on clothes that were left for her that are of the night court variety. High-waisted, billowy peach pants cuffed in gold velvet. Cool. The shirt matches with long, sheer sleeves. Yes. And it's a little shot, like a cropped top, so revealing a little bit of her torso skin. Very sexy. I read this as mass taking inspiration from harem pants, which is a, something that was inspired by Turkish traditional clothing. Um, but it actually became popularized as women's fashion in, in the, the more Western world in France in the 1900s. Um, it's sort of also, you know, it makes me think of obviously Disney's Aladdin. They sort of did a yeah, bastardized version. Yeah, like a Jasmine-esque. Yeah, and, and in that costume itself, that kind of came from different places in India. There's um, women's garb from a, the Punjab region of India who, whose clothes look like that. And also they kind of steal from belly dancing, which is of Egyptian origin. But it sounds like a lot like M- M- Mass is drawing from those some of those places where it's – it's feminine and, and sensual, but also very practical. Comfortable, easy to move in, to run. Feminine, exotic. Thin enough that, unless reason to plan to torment me by casting me into the winter wasteland around us, I could assume I wasn't leaving the borders of whatever warming magic kept the place so balmy. She seems like she's admitting to herself that she likes the clothes, but she doesn't go out and directly kind of say it right there. Well, I also feel like it's definitely sexier than she's ever worn in her life. So I I feel like there is the like apprehension about it, but also she ain't mad like, oh, no, my torso is out. And (laughs) oh, no, these clothes are so billowy and silky. She definitely is like not. She she was very open about how much she hated the dresses she was wearing in Spring Court. She's not doing that here. Nah, dude. She's not protesting too much. Um, so she goes up and she's greeted by this real continental breakfast. It's not one of those days in breakfasts either. It's like four seasons level. Whoa, breakfast. like make your own waffle yeah, kind of level? I think so. Dang it. An omelet station. As Reason greets I her. An omelet station. Me too. I'm hungry. I know. Mm. <laughs> Reason greets her. He frowns at her appearance. Rude. Rude. But we're not really sure what he's seeing when he's looking at her. To try to ease into this tense relationship, she offers sort of a half question of, it's not dark. I thought it was dark here. It's not dark. To which he explains, though the solar courts celebrate their respective times of day, not even high lords can go against the sun's demands. Though they fuck with the seasons, so I don't really see why. But yeah. Even Reason says that holding the seasons is some sort of strange ancient magic they don't fully understand. As they banter back and forth, we get why he was frowning at her. Not because he didn't like her outfit, but he's kind of questioning why she's so real thin. When she snaps back at him, why doesn't he just look in her head if that's what he wants to know? And he says that he's not doing that all the time, but sometimes she's practically screaming down the bond, and that a fae with his ability could rummage around in there unless she wants to learn how to shield her brain. So basically, he's saying to her, I can hear you in your head sometimes when you're upset. Or violently puking every night or screaming through the nights. Like, he can feel her doing these things. So he knows that she's really upset and that no one has been helping her. And so he he uses this as a way to say, you should learn how to shield your brain, which she kind of just ignores. And he, she just says, what do you want me? I'm here. What do you want me to do? And he says, I want you to learn how to read. The beginning of chapter six is reason again mocking Feyre about becoming Tamlin's wife. And again, to be fair, she doesn't seem super jazzed about the idea of her being a glorified party planner either, which is what Tamlin seems to want for her. But she's not going to let Reason know that, even though he can kind of look in her head. Instead, Reason wants her to learn reading and shield- shielding skills. To protect herself. And, you know, she, he he's at least picking up on the fact that she doesn't want to just sit around in a in a court. He's He's knowing that she wants to learn stuff. So she begins to lose her temper, and it only serves to make Reason more cool as a cucumber. And as a result, Feyre unknowingly bends a fork in her hand that she's gripping. It's just like, she's so mad. She's so strong. He asks her then, kind of carefully, has anyone ever told you you're rather strong for a high fae? 
They have not. Mm. She realizes, even though she doesn't grace him with a direct answer, she's like in her head going, Tamlin didn't actually mention that to me. Interesting. Reason ponders on whether or not some of the traits of the High Fae who resurrected her will surface in her. As they continue bickering, we finally meet the woman behind the voice from the previous night. If Reasoned was the most beautiful male I'd ever seen, she was his female equivalent. Her bright golden hair was tied back in a casual braid, and the turquoise of her clothes, fashioned like my own, offset her sun-kissed skin, making her practically glow in the morning light. We meet the Morrigan! Ah! Reason introduces her as his cousin, though they don't share many physical traits and similarities. Feyre tries to politely greet her, but Morrigan says, Brothers, Brothers don't, don't shake hands! Brothers, Brothers got, got a hug! <laughs> <laughs> so and she, then she did the fat guy in a little coat bit, but that was weird because she's like a didn't beautiful, know the like, reference. she doesn't get the reference, she's never seen Tommy Boy before, and I, you know, maybe she'd get that bitch in front of a television. Yeah, all I'm saying. show her some movies. So yes, Morgan comes and grabs her up in a big hug. And we quickly learn that Morgan, or Moore, as she's called most of the time, is a, a character who's going to be opening up a new source of a kind of interaction that Feyre has not really experienced with the High Fae. Oh, at you this mean point. warmth? Yeah, just like <laughs> nice. Someone being nice and like just like seeing her as like, like a person. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, even the most amicable. Amicable interactions with the Fae have been kind of strained and reserved, even with Lucian. More is about as far as you can get from that kind of formality. Within her first conversation with Feyre, she's already saying she would have enjoyed seeing Feyre nail Reese's balls to the wall. Yes. By the way, as Feyre has mostly taken to referring to Reason as Reese at this point, we're going to do the same. Yeah. So now he is Reese to everyone. Let's get to know him more. Yeah, and we're just becoming more friendly. It's fine. It's nothing special. We just, you know, we're getting, we're seeing him a lot. So I guess he's going to be Reese. <laughs> oh my now. God, okay. I'm going to say it's Reese, okay. Ferris never really seen Reese affected like this before. Angry she's seen, but sort of standing there handling being mocked, it amuses her. She actually almost smiles. Whoa. But she stops herself so don't. they don't know. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. After a brief introduction to this character and the cousins having a very, you know, familial tete-a-tete, Moore sticks her tongue out at Reese, and Reese rolls his eyes in response. Feyre is seeing this powerful, terrifying high fey in a new light, vulnerable, disarmed. It only serves to confuse her more. Before Reese leads her out of the room, she notes the way that Moore deftly handles the knife in her hand that she uses to slice a muffin and imagines that she may be used to handling weapons, which we will learn more about later. Certainly will. But I wanted to say that Morgan's name has an origin from our Earth's mythology that will give you a good idea about her character's M.O. I didn't actually know this until I had begun researching for this series, but if I if I had ever learned this in some past point in my life those brain cells were wiped away by a bottle of bourbon probably 15 years ago oh yeah um but the morrigan is a figure from irish mythology and it comes from the name morrigan i bet that's how it's said (laughs) (laughs) morrigan which translates to roughly great queen or phantom queen. She's most often connected to war, especially with foretelling doom, death, or victory in battle. Greek and Roman mythology have a goddess figure of war as well, uh, named Athena or Minerva. But in this Irish mythological creature, she's more of a boots-on-the-ground kind of battle shapeshifter who fights. Sick. I know. Sometimes she's represented as three women, and it is also linked to associations of the Banshee creature later on in Irish history. You talking about me? Oh! <laughs> ah! Yeah, the, our Banshee sounds. Everyone get your Banshee sounds out. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that, all of you listening with earbuds. Um, so <laughs> she sometimes, yeah, is sometimes three women. She's also uh, referenced in connection to the Hebrew version of Lilith. This is all to say, yes, that she represents a disruptor, an unruly woman, a force to be reckoned with. Hell yes. Which, baby, I can get behind. Yes. As we continue to read, it's clear that Mass took great inspiration from this mythology with Morrigan's character. 
We next find Feyre and Reese sitting together in one of those aforementioned learning nooks. I want to go so badly. I know. Feyre does want to learn to read. We know this. But the idea of being taunted and left alone and overseen by Reese seems unbearable to her. He lifted a brow. Is it that hard for you to even try in front of me? You're a high lord. Don't you have better things to do? Of course. But none as enjoyable as seeing you squirm. You're a real bastard, you know that? Reese huffed a laugh. <laughs> I've been called worse. In fact, I think you've called me worse. He tapped the paper in front of him. Read that. What a cad! Ugh. Ugh, he's so bad. But in this instance, he's definitely being more of a daddy than a father. Mm, yeah, I think, think that some people might think that. I don't mm, know. Yeah, mm, just some people. But her defiant nature gets the better of her. Because he challenges her, she's going to show him exactly what he wants her to do. I'll show you by doing exactly what you want. She begins to sound out the words on the paper that he's placed in front of her. She gets you... Look, absolutely, D, then she gets kind of stuck on it. She can't sound the word out, so he helps her. Delicious. She finishes the sentence. (gasps) You look absolutely absolutely delicious today, Feyre. What? Oh, my God. She, like, so hates it. Like, she's so, like, not into that. She doesn't like it. No. She doesn't. She's all like, you're bad. You're so bad. Oh, my God. She's taken aback. So he says into her head, it's true, isn't it? Then he proceeds to do what I'll call a double whammy. He both hits on her and he's proving a point. You can double whammy on me anytime, Reese. Just throwing (laughs) that out there. So we're going to, we know now Jackie's a fan. What? No, uh, I'm very good at hiding my feelings. (laughs) Everyone says mysterious Jackie Zabrowski. (laughs) What does she think all the time? Yeah, that's, if there's anything but the LPN people, it's their mystique. (laughs) Um, So he continues to speak into her head. He's complimenting her, but also holding her mind hostage in this moment to show her that this is what could happen to her if someone with his powers wants to attack her. She's frozen in place, much like she was the first time he did this to her way back at the spring court. He tells her, as paralyzed as she is, this is only the precipice of her mind, that if he wanted to, he could crush her brain into porridge. He commands her to push him out. I couldn't. Those claws were everywhere, digging into every thought, every piece of self. He pushed a little harder. Shove me out. I like Mass's visualization here of Feyre trying to pry a thousand claws from her mind and not being able to do it. Then she does what every office retreat tries to do but can never accomplish. She starts to think... Outside the box. Oh, I thought it was trust falls. And then all of a sudden she trust gets up falls. and throws her body at him. And it's like, will you catch me? Are you going to catch me? <laughs> Which doesn't help it. No. <laughs> um, instead of pulling them out one by one, she creates a wave inside of her mind to wash all of the claws away. Though it's not perfect. He sort of lets her win. He relents as though all he wanted was for her to start trying. She's exhausted, but he makes her do it again. This time she visualizes a wall of adamant snapping down, slicing the claws in half. Cool. Yeah. Against her better judgment, she's actually learned some things this day. But she can't let him see this acknowledgement that she's actually been helped. She again tries to reason her way out of this bargain. As her rage ramps up, Reese says to her, He's not her enemy. And bitterly recalls under the mountain. She is not having it. She doesn't want to talk about under the mountain. No, because it's so much easier to pretend it never happened and let them coddle you. I don't let them coddle. They had you wrapped up like a present yesterday. Like you were his reward. I mean, no lies detected. I mean, he ain't wrong. He demands she continue to practice, but allows her to work in quiet as he puffs away in smoke. Turns into night. He turns into night. So fucking hot. So (laughs) she does as she's instructed and practices for the rest of the afternoon. When Reese returns, she's exhausted, but he's not done for the day. 
He leads her up one of the spires of the impressive mountaintop estate. And at the top of the spiral staircase, we enter a bit of a war room, not the Steve Bannon one. It's mostly bare, but for a large table bearing a massive map of Prithian and a map that's also tacked against the wall. If we our, our map had arrived, I would be referencing it right now. <laughs> They study the map on the table together, and Feyre sees that there have been detailed notes made of every place in Perithian but the Night Court. The Night Court has been left at blank entirely, not even a mountain range is marked. Curious. The map also contains the outline of the wall separating humans from Fey. Tell me what you see. A world divided in two. And so... From that, he questions whether or not it should remain that way. I whipped my head toward him. My family! I halted on the word. I should have known better than to admit to having a family, that I cared for them. Your human family, Reese finished, would be deeply impacted if the wall came down, wouldn't they? So close to its border. If they're lucky, they'll flee across the ocean before it happens. Will it happen? Reason didn't break my stare. Maybe. Why? Because war is coming, Feyre. He became Irish. Oh, again. wow. Winter is coming. High burn is coming, Feyre. Oh, look at you with your ascento. <laughs> at the start of Chapter 7, Feyre has mistaken Reese's statement as a threat that he is in fact going to be attacking the human world. It's hard to blame her. She's just getting batted around by all these hot, confusing fae. We don't know who's good and who's bad. She's like, maybe Reason wants to kill my family. She's I don't trying know. trying to suss it out. Yeah. And then Reese almost sounds like, I don't know, what is that, hurt? He says, I'm not going to invade the mortal lands. He goes on to inform her that it was, in fact, not over with Amarantha. And you will recall at the end of the first book, Feyre knows this. She overhears whenever she's with Nuala and Serajwin that the Adder is conferring with one of the courtiers of Highburn about how they need to watch it because Highburn's getting pissed. Mm -hmm. Confused, she starts to argue that that can't be. Tamlin hasn't said anything to her. And then she realizes, oh, he probably wouldn't have told her because yeah, he girl. doesn't tell her anything. No, she don't know nothing about what he does all day. He just like, he just gets on a horse or just does whatever he does and gets out of there. She doesn't know what the fuck's going on. No, and that, if there's one thing that makes me crazy, it's people deciding that information that I want, I can't handle, so I'm not going to hear about it. It's father duties is what it is. Reese and I'm not talking about daddy's poops. <laughs> Of duties. Father's duties. <laughs> yep, 12 on the inside. Yep, all right. Mm. Uh, so, Reese says that the king of Hybern allowed Amarantha to hold this little obstacle course of horror kingdom, basically as an experiment to see how long a kind kingdom might be able to hold power over Prithian. So, basically, he was using Amarantha as a, like a, a lab rat, taking notes. Reese goes on to say that Prithian itself is important to the king because what he really wants is to reign the big ass continent to the west. Wait, to the east. Point to a fake map to the east of Prithian. And that the entirety of Prithian is just a stepping stone to him to get to that much bigger chunk of land. He's being a real selfish Sally. That's what I say about the King of Highburn. So thus, Feyre learns of Reese's intentions for locking her into this bargain. He needs an ally. He needs to ally all of Prithian, in fact, in order to stand a chance against Highburn. Down with Highburn! Which is almost an impossible task due to all these age-old feuds within the High Lords themselves. Tamlin, for example, hates Reese. Yes. So how are they supposed to come together to work against the king? Well, this is why he has, in fact created this bargain with Feyre. We also learn at this point that Reese fought in the Great War on the side of humans and that he knows the ways of the Lord and the high priestesses and that he don't trust them. Reese is confiding in Feyre here. He's entrusting her with valuable information and he is questioning why Tamlin is not divulging his information to his high ladies. There what? 
are no high ladies. Hamlin said there are no high ladies. Reese looks angry at the suggestion. Yeah, he does. And he says, yes, of course there could be high ladies. And doesn't that just hit home in the U.S. of A? Hmm? Interesting. A lady president? What? But she's going to get her blood all over the Oval Office. I mean, that'd they be awesome. They smear their blood. I think that makes her more powerful. Yeah, honestly, it is just usurping her power. You just got to gotta claim it. Yeah. How else are we supposed to claim it? Oh, uh, Bleeding all over everything. Reese makes it clear in these scenes that she possibly holds great power under her skin and that she should learn to wield it. Well, this is obviously more empowering than the thing that Tamlin's done, which is kind of dismiss her. It's clear that Reese wants to use her as well as a weapon. So we don't really know how much of this is coming from a caring place. Of him. Although he is saying to her, hey, I want to use you as yeah. a weapon. Will you work with me? So it's not even so much like like he's, he's not tricking manipulating her. her. Yeah, yeah, he's not tricking her. He's straight up just being like, hey, you want to work with me? Because like, do you really want your family to die? The family that doesn't care about you, yes. But do you really want your family to die? So why don't we like make sure this war doesn't happen? Feyre pushes back to this, saying that Tamlin won't allow her to train, and he responds... You are no, no one's one. subject. Ooh, gives me chills. <laughs> Reese, no. It's so empowering, but it also somehow makes me want to say, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, I am no one's subject, sir. Thank you. Um, so, yes. I went rigid at the flash of teeth, the smoke-like wings that flared out. I will say this once and only once. Reasoned purred, stalking to the map on the wall. You can be a pawn, be someone's reward, and spend the rest of your immortal life bowing and scraping and pretending that you're less than him, than Ianthe, than any of us. If you want to pick that road, then fine. A shame, but it's your choice. The shadow of wings rippled again. He goes on to challenge her. Suggesting that she does not want this life Tamlin is offering her. She gets mad and enraged at his arrogance. But he asks her to think it over and reminds her it is her choice in no one else's. Not even Daddy High Lord's. Nope. She continues her week alone and Reese leaves her be. She also continues her lessons in writing and shielding. Reasoned is the most handsome High Lord. Reasoned is the most delightful High Lord. Reasoned is the most cunning High Lord. Ugh! arrogance but he is giving her these things to write and she's learning new words and also kind of flirting with her as the weeks Whoa. come to yeah Whoa. he's a very he's Whoa. very he's a flirty fay he's a little flirty fay as the week comes to a close there is word sent to reese's court that there's been a massacre of priestesses in another land as though a message is being sent we watch reese and more debate what to do in this scene Feyre learns also, that vanishing into thin air like reason does is called winnowing. And it's sort of like the same concept of as a wormhole. Where, where you fold the piece fold of the paper. paper. Yes. Science. Yeah. When it comes time for Feyre to go back, she and Reese are not friendly, but not full enemies, I guess. They're almost like frenemies, They're almost frenemies. Say? They're almost frenemies. Oh, my frenemies. God. So she tries to reason with him to get out of this bargain again, but he brushes it off. He asks if she's ready to face the consequences of the day that she was taken by him. And Can you imagine mad. how much you wouldn't want to go back? Mm. Like, talk about Sunday scaries. I'd just be like, I can't. Oh, it is a Sunday scary. I oh, my gosh. I know. You have to go back. You got to go deal with, like, Father Tamlin and what in the wake of the disaster that you left behind. Yeah. But all she, do she doesn't want Reese to know this. So she's just like, take me back. Take me back. And... Reese returns her to Tamlin's manor, and Feyre rushes inside. Just get away from me, Reese. I don't like you. Tamlin, who is meeting with Lucian at the time, rushes to her, clearly only relieved to see her. He's not reacting in anger or shame from the wedding, so that's good. He's excited to see you. Are you all right? Are you hurt? He what, just wants to know she's okay. She lets him know she's fine and that she was not harmed. But he also scowls at the night court fashion she is still wearing. Yeah, because she looks hot as shit. Yeah, probably. He has sort of a tepid response to as they're having this conversation. Like, he says, I'm going to find some way to, to break this, I promise. But he doesn't really mean it. They start to get 
up on each other. Mm-hmm. They're they're they they're lost in the throes of passion. They miss each other. They're just about to get married. They're all they're all entwined with each other. And then Tamlin stops her. Tamlin stepped back, shaking his head as if to clear the desire addling his senses. We hadn't been apart for so long since Amarantha, and he wanted to press me for information about the night court. Tamlin. Again, we see Tamlin not register Feyre's needs here. And I could sympathize with him wanting information from her, except that he doesn't tell her anything. Yeah, so you're going to juice the orange? You get the orange back and you're not going to suckle on the orange. You're not going to bite down on the orange. You're going to just rip off. You're just going to, like, squeeze the orange with the peel still on. At least take the peel off. Nope. He's chomping right down, squishing it, making it into some gross orange juice. I hate orange juice. It hurts my chest. Yeah, very acidic. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So he's not giving her any other information. And all of a sudden that he needs to use her at his convenience. I don't care for this. No, I do not. Maybe we don't know some element of why he's doing this yet. Maybe we don't know. But I don't like it. He starts pressing her for information. And it's clear that while Reese wanted this allyship, Tamlin sees Reese and the Night Court as his enemies. He pushes her further. She says, this feels an awful lot like an interrogation. She describes everything that happened. Even though she doesn't feel comfortable, he keeps pressing. And she tells him everything that went on, everything inside of the the tower in this mountain. She reveals that Reese suggested that she train. Yeah. She wants to know if Tamlin suspected that she might hold these powers. I wasn't stupid enough to mention the mental shield training. Not right now. Training would draw too much attention, Tamlin said. You don't need to train. I can guard you from whatever comes our way. Let me take care of myself. (sighs) Yuck. I can guard you. She took... You didn't do any... Okay, I know we're not just like stood by. Okay, you oh, I know that you want to make up for what happened under the mountain where you just watched this shit happen and you didn't put yourself on the line for it and now you want to make up for it, but it's fucking too much too late. Yep. Exactly. It makes me mad. She resists and he shuts her down. He also dismisses her when she says that Reese wants a partnership within the the courts. And here you begin to see a part of Tamlin that's not super likable. He wants to, her to, to stay small, perhaps who he thought she was when she first arrived to the spring court all, you know, those months back. But even then, she wasn't small. She was providing for her entire family. This might be a problem. And hopefully Tamlin can find a way to embrace this bigger than life version of Feyre, the Fey version. And that's where we're going to stop for the day because we've been going and going and yapping and yipping. Oh, my God. And so much happens now. Like, it's so great the way she writes because so like so much plot is jammed into these books and not in a way of like, I don't even know what's going on. It's just like such a page turner. You get so sucked into it. Action packed. uh, And it's just such a great Fun read. I hope you guys are enjoying uh, reading along with us because this has been, this is just, oh, uh, it's a fey dream come true. It really is. Uh, except that, you know, we can't be the fey and that would probably be better. But this is the second best thing. Yes. You guys have been sending messages that have been so fun and I'm so glad some of you are reading in in time with us because I wasn't sure how many would be doing that. But now so many of you have been reaching out and saying you are. Which is why we're trying really hard not to do spoilers. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I don't know. I think our emotions might betray us at, at times. At times. At times. Sure. I don't. Not in. Not in any other point in our lives has that happened. No. No. I'm um, very, again mysterious. Jackie Zabrowski. Mystique. Ooh. Ianthe. There you go. She did it. I did it. Join us next week, won't you?